Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Family Treehouse, a podcast series brought to you by Storied, where I chat with people that have a passion for genealogy, storytelling, or both. I'm your host, Heather Honert, and today I am very excited to chat with our guest, Annette Gindler. She is the author of a fantastic book that I just adore called How to Write Compelling Stories from Family History. So we'll chat with her about that today. Welcome, Annette, to the show. Hi, Heather. Thanks for having me. Very excited to to get a chat with you today. So why don't you start, Annette, by telling us a little bit about your background and how you kind of got started with family history and writing um, your family stories. Sure. So for me, it really began with a trip to the Czech Republic, to my grandparents' hometown. That was in 2002. I had not been there before. And that trip, you could say, changed my life. So I always, I always warn people, or I encourage them, like if you start digging into your family history, it can change your life in ways that you won't foresee. Some people think about, you know, they'll uncover secrets or stuff they didn't know, which of course, inevitably we all do, but it's not just about that. Like for me, when I was in my grandparents' hometown, I felt so many undercurrents, you know, and I felt like I'd been there before, which of course I hadn't, right? And so I was like, try to find out about the story here. You know, my, yes. my, my grandmother had been a good storyteller and she was my main conduit. She She uh, and my grandfather lived in that town as young adults and as adults and began raising the family there until they were uh, deported right after World War II. So, so, you know, that that was their hometown. But, you know, like you hear stories from your grandparents, that doesn't mean that you can actually sort of put it all together. It's one thing, you know, to to know all those anecdotes. It's a whole nother to, to really know what happened. And so thankfully, my grandfather... Uh, left a set of typed memoirs. They're on thin onion skin. Um, oh. And he typed those up in his, shortly before he passed away in, in the early 60s. And he had a couple of, he, it was never finished, but there's a chapter there about his sister, and a chapter about his brother, a chapter about his career. Um, and the two chapters about his siblings basically, you know, sort of encapsulate the, the story uh, of the family there. And uh, so, so that's how it all began, you know, and then I started, I was so interested, um, and it so happened that my great aunt's love story paralleled mine, yes. uh, or had paralleled mine, and I kind of knew that, but I, I really didn't know all the details, so that started me really into writing initially essays about various things that had happened, particularly during the Nazi times. That always makes for good drama, obviously. Um, yeah. And eventually that whole quest became my, my memoir, Jumping Over Shadow. And then based on that, um, you know, in the in the meantime, I'd gotten a master's of fine arts and creative writing. So writing kind of became my uh, second career, I used to be. I used to be in, in HR consulting, so it was a to- I had a totally different trajectory initially, or in my you know earlier years. Uh-huh. And my book, How to Write Compelling Stories from Family History, grew out of my experience writing Jumping Over Shadows, and I ended up giving a lot of workshops around that. You know, how do you take the family history and really make it make it an interesting story. And I thought, oh, well, I do know a thing about that. So <laughs> I ended up teaching workshops around that. And then people started bugging me about, do you have materials? So that's how my second book came about, because I thought, yeah, I, I do have materials. And so I turned that into that book. Yeah, I, I love one thing that really stood out to me in that book was your, you made a comment about, I think it maybe was the second, did you, has you, have you visited the Czech Republic twice? Yeah, I've been there a number, a number of times recently, because then I, I had to go on research trips, actually, you know, once I started writing the story, then I had, like, lists of stuff, I like, I need to go see the cemetery, where's the cemetery, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so you've been a couple of times or several times. The, the thing that stood out to me that I thought was important to anybody that's going to go someplace 
um, and kind of check out their family history, you said, make sure you read your notes before you go um, because you missed climbing those stairs <laughs> yes. if you were there. And so I thought that was, that was super powerful advice, you know, to make sure you're really, you know, researched and ready to go so you don't miss out on opportunities. Yeah, it's it's uh it, it's kind of a dull thing, right? Like you you would think, you know, like if you're going on a research trip, that's what you do. But um, I had um, on that particular trip, that was my last trip. I went with my sister, and you know, we had I had a certain agenda of stuff I wanted to do, take pictures of certain things. She took a lot of pictures of me in the town, one of which ended up being sort of the the banner on my website. Yeah. So so that that, that was sort of the main mission, right? And then she kind of suggested. Uh, to go and check out our grandparents, uh, our great grandparents, great yeah, great great grandparents' mill that is sort of in the area because we we did have her car, so we were able to travel around and um, yeah, I, I just wish I had sort of had that on my horizon and had read my grandmother's memoirs before we went there because um, she had described some things very explicitly about that place that you know, I missed because I, I hadn't read yeah. it. Yeah. Tell us why you think that storytelling is such an important part of, you know, the whole piece of family history. Because it's what gets passed on, ultimately. You know, people, a lot of genealogy, genealogical research, and I'm not a genealogist, I want to say that up front, my, my yeah. aunt on my mom's side is, and I've seen her work, it's very meticulous, you know, yeah. she's got like a resume for everyone. So it's a lot about gathering the information, who did what, when, where, who's descended from whom, you know, stuff like that. Um, but that's not something that people will talk about at great, like, yeah. like we, people share stories, you know, this, I experienced this and that. And so I think it's really important to write down those stories. Like if my grandfather hadn't written down his version of the family story, you know, his experiences focusing in on his relationship with his siblings and his siblings, I would have not been able to write Jumping Over Shadows. Like I would have basically no material. I would have some of the anecdotes that my grandmother told me, but you know, like that, that, that is sort of my memory. My brother and sister are like, really? Like, you remember that? So it gets very fuzzy there. Obviously, if you write a family story, you're going to rely on more than just the research that you did usually. You know, you will also have anecdotes that people told. You, know, you might have letters, you might have photographs. So it all sort of comes together. But I really think, you know, the, for me, the heart of family history is in the stories is in what a grandparent passes on to a grandchild. It's not gonna be the chronology of, you know, who lived where and when they right. immigrated to the US. It's gonna be like the story of, I don't know, when I was on the boat or yeah. stuff like that, you know, like, um, and that's also, I think stories are uh, so helpful because we we learn from them, right? Okay. And we, we want to know, for instance, when 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 COVID happened, right? I wish I wish I could ask my grandmother, hey, you lived through the Spanish flu. Like, yes. what was that like? But nobody wrote anything down. Yeah. yeah. So so that's for me, that's where it's at. And that's why I love teaching people how to write stories from their family history and how to, you know, take all those materials and turn it into something that someone else can read, you know, 50 years down the line when you might not be around anymore. And have a reference point and be like, oh, this happened before, and this is how they dealt with it. I could learn something from that. Yeah, yep. I, I love that take on it. Being able to learn something, I think that is that's powerful. How would you suggest people that are just kind of you know getting into this, and mm -hmm. you know whether it's just trying to build a family tree? And I know you said you're not a genealogist, but just the whole story part of it, how would you suggest they, they start going about writing a story? Um, so the challenge here is to understand what a story is, okay? And that, I have to say, took me a while to understand. So, um, and the best way to think about it actually is, is if you go to the theater 
you watch a play or when you watch a movie, right? Um, it's always, it's not, a, it's not a, this happened and then that happened. It's not a sort of chronological account, right? It is always about something, you know, there's always action involved, there are characters involved, and it is about some meaningful transformative event, right? So yeah. I think what, what you need to ask yourself is, why am I telling this story? Like, why, why does it matter? You know, yeah. um, and it can be really little things. So one of the starting points that I, that I like to give people is in sort of my introductory class, I have them write about a family object, something that they inherited or they got from someone or they kept when they cleaned out someone's apartment write about that thing. Like, give us a story. Like, why is that vase sitting around in your apartment? Yeah. Who did it belong to? Um, and why do you keep it, right? And it's it's a great exercise because it focuses in on one object. Mm -hmm. So why, you know, it doesn't have to be like a grand event, right? But like, why do you keep that vase? Yeah. You know, like it reminds you of someone or something, like there's a reason, right? Um, and it might just be sort of a characterization characterization of yourself that you like that type of glass I don't know whatever it might be so it, it's sort of a a way to focus in tell a bit of the family history by focusing on the object and the people around it so that's a a, a great sort of way to, to, to think about it and pretty much everybody you know can think of an object to write about yeah I think that you hit the nail on the head. I think you, it doesn't have to be some grand thing, you know, even just getting, you know, one little bit down on, on paper, just getting started, I think sometimes is the yeah. hardest part for people. So I love that exercise. Do you have any, um, recommend any resources or tools for somebody that's getting started with writing family stories that that's help, helpful? Yeah, begin. Um, you know, begin with something that interests you, right? Because writing a story is work. A lot of people don't like to write or they, they are afraid of writing or whatever. You know, you can also decide to, to capture it in some other way, but like go with where they're interested. So for me, you know, it was it was that hometown. It was, is what, it was that part of the story. Like, don't let it be sort of an intellectual exercise. Oh, I should do this. Like, no, I want to do this. Like I find yeah. this great aren't interesting. I don't know why I'm going to follow that thread. Like that's where the energy is at. That's where the passion is at. You need to follow that. Um, and that'll help you keep keep focus. You know, my 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 sort of tip off with with the family object is is a great way to start. But another great way to start is to to write about a particular, you know, relative who you are fascinated with or who made a big impression on you and just write down what, what you know about that person. So follow the passion. I, the next question has been um, kind of the hot button question and I've been so looking forward to asking this question to you uh, because I love how you handle it. Um, how do you balance the importance of accuracy with the need to make your story compelling and I think the thing that I came away with from your book is the, I don't know why this stood out so much to me, but it was, I think it was the green polka dotted dress. Is that right? Was it green? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about how you kind of um, weave in the accuracy um, to help with your story. Right. So, so there are two things to talk about here. Um, first of all, don't invent anything. I yeah. think that, you know, if you set out to write a story from family history, then you want to transmit something that's true. Yeah. Um, you don't want to fictionalize it, even if that makes a better story, because then you're you're giving someone a history they didn't have. And I think that is a horrible thing. With that, that being said, you can write, obviously, many, many people do that, you know, to write uh, historical fiction, basically. So fiction based on a true story. I, I actually... I don't know if I um, showed you this, but I've done that myself. My, my latest book is a children's book. Yes. Natalie and the Nazi soldiers. And it is indeed historical fiction. I mean, it's a children's book, but it is based on a true story. So it's based yeah. on the events that my mother-in-law used to tell about being a hidden child during the Holocaust. But it is 
definitely, you know, a fictional story in the, actually only in the way I sort of arranged it chronologically. Um, but it, I'm also dealing with oral history and a child's memories. So, you yeah. know, I did research and I went back to the town where she was hidden. You know, it's, uh, I'm on thin ice here. So that's why I'm like, this is based on a true story. Yes. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, don't drive yourself crazy with accuracy. So the example you brought with the, with the, with the green polka dot address is that, okay, so you're writing about your grandmother on a certain day when something happened. Do you remember what she wore that day? Maybe not, okay? Yeah. But you knew her, you knew how she used to dress, you knew what kind of dresses she had. So you put her in one of those dresses. Right. That's accurate enough, you know, like if you wrote about, because it, it might be usually, you know, when you, when you characterize something like the way they appear in the world is important. So if she had a certain way of dressing, you know, then, then use that to characterize yeah. her, but you don't have to drive yourself nuts with you know did she wear that dress on that day that's immaterial to the story mm -hmm. but right. whether she did what she did or whether she said what she said that's that's important you, you need to be accurate with that and then if you don't know you can speculate you know yeah. just be open with your reader and say i don't know exactly what happened i did all the research i couldn't find it out you know, um, and just be open about it. And you can speculate based on what you found out, based on what you knew about the characters and sort of let your reader in on that. And actually that can be quite engaging because if yes. you've done a good job of characterizing these people, your reader will already be with you. Yeah. They'll already be like, hmm, why did they do that? Like, I wonder, you know, and then if it's kind of open-ended, that will stick in their mind. And that's right. kind of what you want. You don't always have to have a, you know, red bow at the end of the story. It can, it can be quite a satisfying read if you convey what happened, if you can characterize these people, bring them alive and sort of leave the mystery, the mystery. Yeah. Yeah, great, that's great advice, I love that. My favorite part is always asking everyone, what is a, a particular story that is a favorite of yours that you like to tell? That I like to? That you like to tell. Um, no, I, I mean, I, ha I have one, but I, I'm not sure I don't want to disclose that, but. Um, That's okay. You know <laughs> I, I have a, a, a secret that I discovered. Um, but, and let's say it's but not, but was it, it was a mystery, right? Like, so my, my great grandfather, my grandmother's father, committed suicide in 1938 when the Nazis took over um, in their hometown. And it was never quite clear why that happened. My grandmother never talked about it. That was her father. And uh, I questioned my dad once. I was a pretty morbid kid, so I, I wanted to know how everyone died. Don't ask me why I wanted to know that, but I did. So, so I asked him, and and he um, had his had sort of a a party line that yeah. he, my grandfather was so distraught about um, what the Nazis had made of because he was quite he 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 was a writer himself. He was very much into the German language and literature and, and art, and, and he was. So appalled at what happened in the culture. That always seemed to me a bit of a thin, a thin uh, explanation for someone to take his life. Um, and I was actually, I was researching something else. I was researching the Jewish history, the, the history of the Jewish community in that in my grandparents' hometown in a history book. And I happened on something that that could point to a different reason. And so I was, it was one of those shocking moments where I was like, I didn't see that coming. So I'm not going to disclose it entirely because it's, it's one of the, um, one of the uh, satisfying points in jumping over shadows. But for me, that was a, a great, I don't know great, but a, a, a profound moment in, in terms of doing research in the, into the family history. Just to kind of 
end this up here, what would be if you could share one tip or trick with our with our listeners and, and viewers, what would you say is your, your number one piece of advice? So I have two pieces of advice. First of all, start small. So a family history does it does not have to be a book. It does not have to be a long story. Just start with one small story, one small project that you want to write. It can be, you know, in the, you might end up with a collection of stories, you might not, but whatever you put down on paper will be valuable to someone down the line in your family or even someone completely different who might happen upon your stories and is doing research about a particular area, a particular time. So anything you put down is great start small, you know, don't yeah. be like, oh, I got to write, you know, the story of my ancestors, because that's so intimidating, particularly when yes. you're not a writer, when you're not really used to doing that. So keep in mind, so that's my, my second piece of advice. Something is better than nothing. Yeah. Whatever you write down is better than nothing at all. So, so just get started. There's so many tools out there. My book is obviously one. Um, you guys are offering so many great prompts. So, you know, they're, they're just, just get it down. Yeah, those great, great things. I think that's the, getting started is the hardest um, for so many people. So that, that's a great piece of advice. Right. I mean, another thing to do actually is to read memoirs about, you know, by people who've written something similar, you know, similar time yeah. era, similar person, something, because it'll inspire you. You know, you'll be yes. like, oh. I could do that. I mean, I got the idea for the children's book when my son was in, you know, in third grade and they read um, Patricia Polacco's The Butterfly, which is also a story about a hidden child in France during the Holocaust. Uh -huh. And I thought, wait a minute, that's our family history. Like I should, <laughs> I should capture that. And I, and I really, I mean, it was on the back burner for a long time because I had no idea how to write a children's book, yeah. but I knew it needed to be a children's book because the main character is a child. Um, so it took me a long time, but but you know I did it. So who knows? You might read something and be, and be inspired. Yeah. Well, and I I think that's why I loved your how to write compelling stories for fa from family history so much is because you would you know have a concept in there and then have a story that you would kind of highlight that with. And I thought that was really powerful. I liked that a lot. Thank you. Well, Annette, thank you so much for your expertise and your passion with, with writing family stories. And I am very honored that, that you spent time with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored that um, we talked. And I hope, you know, if we can inspire one more person to write their family, <laughs> it's great. That's always the way I look at it. Just one more person. Mm -hmm. So until next time, friends, embrace the power of family histories, untold tales, and embark on a journey of discovery. Let the ink flow and the words dance as you weave together the th threads of your ancestors' lives. Start writing your family stories today and let their voices echo through the generations to come at story.com. And that brings us to the end of this episode of The Family Treehouse, where we celebrate the power of storytelling and preserving our family legacies. Story is more than just a platform for sharing stories. Dive into those historical records and newspapers, discovering the hidden gems that bring your ancestors to life. Add branches to your family tree, connecting the dots between generations. Thank you for joining us on this storytelling journey. Your stories matter, and through story, they have the power to resonate across time and touch the hearts of generations to come. Keep uncovering your family's history and keep the spirit of storytelling alive with Storied.